But we mentioned that Bob likes movies. Yes. Um, what's his favorite movie? I would say probably Dirty Harry. And uh, just to listen to Bob, he'll imitate Clint. And very good at it. Just very, very good at it. Even though, you know, make my day and being Clint Eastwood uh, kind of silly, but it does just kind of make you smile and, and encourage you. And, so. and we'll talk, he'll talk to me. Then he'll start talking about his Western movies. And next thing you know, I just get quiet in there and I'm doing my work and I look over and he's snoring. <laughs> um, Clint Eastwood was one of his favorite actors. He loved westerns and that he, his big goal was to actually be in a movie. He has such a gentle spirit and that and that really certainly encompasses how I remember Bob. He certainly was a, uh, a country man. He always wanted to talk about Ickesburg, which is um, I, probably where he lived. I know he, he um, grew up in Perry County until the age of nine and at nine he went to Pennhurst. Um, so he but he very much carried those memories um, with him from Perry County and the Ickesburg uh, Theater. He would always say, you know, he wouldn't say theater, he would say theater and the uh, fire company in, in Ickesburg. And then he also, he was a, a Clint, he's a Clint Eastwood fan. So he liked all of the movies that were um, connected to Clint Eastwood. So Bob's a very caring man. Um, immediately, he was very friendly. He's very trusting of people coming in and working with him, which makes it easy for people to get to know him. He's genuinely caring about my family, my pets. He always asks every day how they were doing. He's just a very kind man. His favorite football team is uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. So when they're on, he and he knows the score. He's waiting for me to come back in and tell me what the score is. My first day, I believe, was October 3rd. And when I was in Area 3, where I worked at, I had an individual come over and introduce himself very boldly, put his hand out for me to shake and everything. He said, hello, my name is Bob Middle, Robert Middle. I've never seen, I know, like, right? I've never seen him like that. Mm. So we got to become friends. So most of the time when we were at CIT, I didn't actually work with Bob, but I did get to see him daily because he stopped by my group to say hello. He, he gets up when he wants to. He rests when he wants to. He chooses which activities he wants to go out you know, and do. He likes to be around people and be around others. So when there's activities that he thinks he's going to enjoy, he'll go do them. And I, he, I think he's always viewed himself, and I think others have always viewed him as a hard worker, but I think he's enjoying that kickback retired man's life. So we started to go through the Harrisburg Area Community College campus. And as we kind of got into the campus, surrounded by the buildings, Bob pointed at one of the buildings and he said, what's that? I said, it's a classroom. I don't really know what they do in there, but this is a college campus and they teach students here. So then we got a little bit further and Bob said, A, B, C, D, E, I'm not going to E. And I wasn't sure I heard him correctly, so I asked him again, Bob, what did you say? And he said, A, B, C, D, E, I'm not going to E. So I looked at the staff because I was unsure what he was trying to communicate and the staff kind of very quietly said to me, he's talking about the institutions. And it just hit me in that moment that the campus setting reminded him of his time in the institution. And even after 40 years of being with Sea Park, that's still in him. And there's trauma triggers for Bob um, that still come up in the course of his care. Bob's time at Pennhurst, um, I do know it was around the age of eight or nine, one of those. 
There was not one nice thing that he could say. He mentioned before about uh, f uh, physical abuse. Yeah, about um, physical abuse a lot. And um, some of these people that he randomly, these names that he'll just randomly say, some people are just from movies or some from Special Olympics or people, just friends from around um, his area. And uh, two of them that he mentions are people that you know from Pennhurst and he would describe their um, their their bed and the bed was like like a crib. I'm sorry. It was like a crib and um, he's like when they um, he remembers the person as running around a crib like the like the lions and the guy that tames, tames the lion. So to me, when I, when I hear that, it's like, was it another individual in this crib running around and was it like a staff or somebody? Like, uh, it's, it's hurtful. It's kind of limited. There's been physical abuse, sexual abuse. He's mentioned it throughout several people. One thing that he's come to me and said many times is that he was the retard from Philadelphia. And I used to, I asked him, why would you say that, Bob? You know, and he says, well, they made us do that talent show. And I'm assuming they put him on display to do that. And I just spent the rest of my time trying to build him up. You know, th that is not you. You are one of the smarter people I know, and you're a good person, you know, and they, that wasn't very nice of somebody to do to you. He, he has told me in the past that he's had bad dreams about it. And I would love to just wipe that from his memory, but you know, they're there to stay. As a mother to a son with a disability, when I look at the young pictures of Bob, I can't imagine living in a world where institutionalization would have been recommended. I can't even imagine letting my son go like that, whether institutions had a good reputation or not. I just can't imagine the hole that would leave in me as a mother, um, the worry about the care. Um, but I do know that since Bob has been at Sea Park, he has lived a robust life in the community. He has had, had a job, he's retired. Um, he takes part in his interests and recreational things. How is that any different from someone without an intellectual disability? That's ultimately the goal of our work, but we need other people in the community to reciprocate um, so that we can have a more inclusive community. When I get there, they said that he had three broken ribs from his from his fall out of bed, and then he had a, a broken shoulder. They said since he came in there, you know, they, he was tested for COVID, and that he had tested positive, but had a low grade fever, which was like a shock. Asked the nurse, is he wearing his dentures? He's not eating. No, he's not wearing his dentures. Well, we brought the dentures up, like you guys had asked, and it was about two weeks ago. Why isn't he wearing his dentures? Spoke to the speech therapist. Speech therapist didn't even know he had dentures. Where was the dentures at? Sitting on the table right next to him, they told us. So that was about a good three weeks of having his dentures in. A lot of this could have been avoided. I, I don't know, it's like, why even, why ask? 
and pretend like you're doing something and you're and you're really not. And it it just has me thinking like what was actually really happening? And I feel like without them allowing us into the hospital, without them working with us to have some sort of contact with Bob, and we're helping them help Bob, but they're not helping him. And they're not really paying attention to what we're sending them. They don't have the time to read our paperwork. They don't have the time to take care of our individuals. So why not allow us in that hospital? Why not? The time that I was at home, those two weeks, all I could do was cry. This is happening on my watch. I felt that I trusted this hospital. To me, that whole hospital experience, he was restricted. His rights was taken away. He, his, we are fighters and we will not allow We're just, we're going to continue to fight for Bob. We're going to be there every chance that we get for him. And I think this time around, we're not going to stop. I think the current barriers that people with intellectual disabilities face are still some of the same ones they had before. The one thing we're fighting for is not just, okay, we want you at our church, is we want to miss you if you don't show up on Sunday. That's what needs to happen. And that's not just in churches, that should be at jobs and, you know, at the gym. And, and that's what we want, for people to be so accepted and part of a community, belonging, that they're missed when they're not there.